Greetings from LA, my dear, dear friends. This is Daisuke, and I very, very much hope that this video finds you well and in very, very good spirits wherever you are in the world. And today, if you don't mind, I would very much like to continue on with our journeys, our discussions, our discoveries, and our explorations with respect to the recent releases made by the Criterion Collection during this year of 2024. And that brings us to a title which has been designated by Criterion at spy number 1214. And this is a work which is described as being from the year 1964. And the name of the filmmaker is Mikhail Kalatozov. And the name of the work is, and please pardon me for my very poor pronunciation, I hope you can forgive me, but I will do my best. The name of the work is Soy Kuba, or as it's known for purposes of this release, I am. Cuba. This is the work, the phenomenal, amazing, epic film, uh, which is described as being from the year 1964, and it is from the filmmaker Mikhail Kalatozov, and among the uh, many great artists and professionals and collaborators uh, uh, in creating and, and preparing and producing and making this film. And there is, of course, uh, the cinematography by Sergei uh, Rusevsky, uh, which we'll speak a little bit about later in the context of one of the supplements that is accompanying this Criterion release. But uh, we have this work, 1964, directed by Mikhail Kalatozov. And among its really uh, great, great cast, we have people like Raul Garcia, and uh, Salvador Wood and Sergio Corrieri and others uh, and this is a work which is called Soy Cuba or I am Cuba and once again please pardon me please please pardon me for my very terrible pronunciation of titles and phrases and names I hope you can forgive me but I will do my very best uh, but this is Soy Cuba I am Cuba. And uh, as I mentioned, the Criterion Collection has, uh, on this occasion of 2024, re-released or re-had this film returned to the Criterion Collection uh, itself, uh, courtesy of this new release uh, at spine number 1214. This is what I have here, which is the 4K UHD plus Blu-ray combo release. So it's two discs, one which is the 4K UHD disc, and the other, which is the Blu-ray disc uh, with uh, supplements. And we'll talk a little bit about the contours of the presentation and also the supplemental material and other aspects of the physical uh, packaging and design and the release itself, the, the Criterion Collection release. I should also point out that, you know, I mentioned that this title is, in a sense, re-emerging or returning to the Criterion Collection. And the reason why I choose these words are, or the reason is that uh, for those of you who might know the Criterion Collection Laserdisc catalog, uh, you will be aware that uh, I Am Cuba was indeed a Criterion Collection Voyager Laserdisc back in the day. And so uh, in that way, we have uh, re-emerging into the Criterion Collection Physical Media Fold back uh, uh, with, of course, the, the spine number 1214. But in that spirit, it is, uh, in a sense, returning to the Criterion Collection. So I always get a, a thrill uh, whenever something like this happens. You know, a title from the Laserdisc catalog returns in a new Blu-ray or DVD or 4K disc, uh, that being the case uh, right now. So that's a little, uh, that that's, a, 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 I think, a neat thing uh, to consider. And I think uh, uh, perhaps, uh, uh, you know, and overall, of course, overall, and perhaps most uh, importantly, most triumphantly, is uh, the fact that we have this film uh, presented here, uh, purported to be based on a 4K digital restoration, uh, which we will talk about as well uh, a little bit later. But we have the availability of this film readily available uh, to watch in this format. I Am Cuba, the Kalatozov work, I Am Cuba. And my goodness, uh, if we were to try to speak about the plot or story structure of this amazing work, I Am Cuba, I think we could focus on the fact that it has a very, I think, uh, lucid and uh, I think really quite uh, strong and easy to follow structure. I mean, it could be said to be uh, vignettes or sort of short stories, kind of omnibus type of work 
focusing in on four distinct stories, uh, four distinct groups of characters, uh, each having their own sets of issues and dilemmas and backgrounds, uh, maybe representing uh, certain walks of life, various walks of life uh, in terms of social milieu, class, generational uh, differences, as well as uh, you know concerns in terms of the immediacy, uh, 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 in terms of uh, maybe uh, job prospects, in terms of uh, dreams about the future, uh, in terms of uh, what the future holds for these people, if at all, uh, the characters that we meet, if at, all, if at all. And that, I think, forms part of the, the great, I think, uh, uh, a way in which this film really highlights you know, sort of an intimate portrait of these uh, characters that we meet along the way. While, of course, I should say, uh, we have uh, the story taking place within uh, the environment and setting and locale and the place that is Cuba. And this is, I think, a really important, uh, 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 this is very important observation to keep in mind because in many ways this film could be said also to be about Cuba. The main character could be the people and place and time that is Cuba, uh, that this film is being made. The early 1960s, which is a very significant uh, one in terms of the, uh, sort of the historical significance of Cuba as a nation and where it finds itself at that time. And also we should find uh, keep in mind about the stories that uh, seem to be, that are taking place within the, the context of the film. So it's being made in the in uh, sort of the early 1960s, but the stories seem to be taking place prior to or up to 1959. And that's a very key moment in terms of uh, the history of Cuba uh, because of the, uh, the revolution. And so these stories seem to be taking place again prior to or up to or leading up to that moment. And so we have aspects of the Batista government uh, in some moments indeed directly referenced, but also uh, the way in which during this time, pre-revolution time, uh, we have uh, the way in which the culture seems to be depicted, uh, the uh, the way in which urban centers uh, are really showcasing a kind of uh, day life and night life that seems to be in maybe social and maybe economic ways being influenced by the uh, relationship with the United States, uh, also in terms of uh, private business concerns as well as public concerns, uh, which showcases, uh, I think, or shows itself, I think, very prominently, especially in some of the vignette stories of the film, in particular the first one, perhaps, as an example. Uh, but we also see how certain attitudes and maybe structural forces, external forces, that seem to be either directly or indirectly referenced, again, pre-revolution forces uh, that are directly or indirectly referenced, how they are finding those, finding their ways to affect, maybe positively or negatively, or maybe to the detriment of the characters that we meet along the way in this film, I Am Cuba, how these forces are affecting the lives of these people and what it is that these people are going to do about uh, the choices that they inevitably have to make. And so uh, this is, uh, uh, sometimes those choices can be very devastating. Sometimes they could have really drastic and uh, far-reaching, uh, maybe even life or death consequences. And sometimes those choices perhaps are inevitable and sometimes those choices, while perhaps, um, again, uh, maybe uh, from a certain interpretive context, might be said to be uh, stemming from some kind of external force. You know, people are trying to do, uh, trying to uh, uh, have a living, have certain pride in what it is they do, raise a family, enjoy their lives and livelihoods, but maybe external forces come in and, and uh, through a set of circumstances that may or may not be beyond those con uh, forces' control, uh, the lives of the people are upended. Uh, in ways that are perhaps uh, uh, without any type of uh, meaningful remedy. Or perhaps it's not just the external forces at play. Maybe what we are seeing or witnessing in the context of these stories is a kind of internal transformation, a kind of viewpoint or outlook that is changing fundamentally. Uh, and so this is a kind of internal transformation or internal struggle or an internal maybe examination of four sets or groups of people 
characters that we meet in these vignettes that each in their own ways could be also uh, to be said to be speaking certain voice or lives or livelihoods of a period or time and place of uh, the people of Cuba uh, leading up to, as I say, 1959. And then, of course, considering uh, the time in which this film is being made, uh, considerations of uh, uh, 1959 and the immediate aftermath thereof leading into uh, the early 1960s. And so uh, that explains a lot in terms of of uh, the cooperation between uh, 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 Cuban filmmaking uh, uh, interests and uh, uh, Russian or Soviet film interests, Moss film, uh, in terms of the, the collaboration uh, that led to the uh, ultimate making of this film, I Am Cuba. Points of such collaboration coming forth or being described in one of the or some of the supplements of this uh, great Criterion release. So we'll talk a little bit about that uh, when we get to the discussions of the supplements. But uh, this is, I think, therefore, in these very general terms, uh, setting itself up to be a very fascinating, uh, almost uh, cultural, historical, uh, artifact type of document uh, that, uh, again, uh, could be said, too, to be focusing indirectly or directly on the idea of ideologies, uh, political ideologies, uh, and uh, may be set forth or being created within the construct or confines of certain political ideologies. It could be said, again, 1959 and into the 1960s. So, and this is very much uh, directly and indirectly uh, keyed into uh, uh, global uh, uh, global uh, geopolitical uh, movements uh, that are related directly to the uh, what is known as the Cold War, uh, but uh, so it is I think very possible uh, to examine this film and, and uh, view this film in the context of a sort of examination of ideologies, and that could in turn lead uh, to the interpretation of this film as being propaganda from the viewpoint of those certain ideologies. And I think that's a very legitimate and reasonable um, uh, type of uh, uh, viewpoint or, or um, uh, interpretation to make, even now when watching this film. I mean, it's, it's perhaps um, uh, a, such a key critical point to keep in mind the historical context and contexts plural when watching this film, I think. You know, I'm not a student of history, and I'm not, a, uh, I'm not an expert, and I don't consider myself to be an expert at all when it comes to the, the, the fine, fine details of historical movements during this time, uh, let alone the history of the United States or Cuba or, or any other country for that matter. But uh, it is, uh, I think, uh, still, uh, even from my uh, from my very shallow, uh, intellectually shallow viewpoint, I can, uh, I, and I, I find that I at least can recognize the importance of keeping that perspective or keeping that in mind, uh, even when I watch this film in the current day of 2024, because uh, it is in many ways that kind of showcasing uh, from a, I think, a very uh, certain and distinct uh, political point of view. Uh, but it also comes to mind the fact that you know this uh, this type of of uh, film and uh, the meeting of cinema and ideology is, of course, not completely. Uh, uh, not completely found in one singular film alone, like I Am Cuba. I mean, it is found in many sorts of films, uh, perhaps very evidently in some films, and perhaps even not so evidently in other films. So in other words, this idea of, of uh, propaganda and ideology uh, and interpretation and engagement with cinema, I think it's existent potentially in in um, many more films that uh, one might initially realize. And so uh, that, therefore, is my way of saying that I don't think it's in any way a kind of detriment, at least from my perspective, to to uh, to see the film uh, uh, from that particular lens because um, it is still ultimately, I think, a very reasonable uh, perspective and I think very important and critical one to have, when, especially when considering the production of this film as well as uh, the placement of this film in terms of the context uh, pre and up to 1959 and then post-1959 for purposes of the production. So uh, in that way, I think it's very important and capturing a certain spirit or spirits and modes. And then turning our attention to maybe the story structure and also the artistry involved, other ways of, I think, for me anyway, to engage with this work is through, again, the sweeping nature of the stories. Now, uh, we can look also at the stories in terms of their own, say, uh, emotional turns and the way that I think they have a kind of accessibility about them. I mean, we have four stories. So we have the first story involving a young woman who is, uh, this is uh, uh, Maria or Betty, and we understand that she is, uh, she uh, needs to, 
uh, have a kind of uh, livelihood uh, in order to do that in this uh, modern day setting of, uh, of Cuba and uh, you know of Havana uh, where we see the nightlife which is very exciting very rich there are certain aspects of music and culture that are at play but there are also we understand uh, business interests that are represented by a certain American uh, businessmen uh, that we see also the development of hotels and casinos that we see in the distance that we understand as part of the milieu and decor uh, that is uh, expressed in one I think one of the most famous shots of the film which is this uh, the way in which the camera seems to be uh, weaving in and out of the crowd and uh, from uh, up on high and even down low even into the swimming pools and catching the people on the on the poolside and dancing and the music it's very hypnotic and quite uh, it sweeps one off one's feet in this way but we also understand too that there are certain perhaps hidden consequences and one such hidden consequence could be the the way in which people like Maria and others need to make a living as, uh, in this kind of escort uh, position uh, and and uh, and escorting uh, these businessmen who come into the sort of the bar or the the eatery or restaurant or the the club etc. And this may have uh, some uh, implications in terms of showcasing her own say uh, social and uh, uh, financial situation when we get to know more about who she is and when some other when the uh, one particular uh, uh, person that she is escorting you know she needs to uh, be the companion to uh, she, uh, finds out more about her uh, her life and where she comes from and also we understand that she has a life beyond her work uh, which involves to her own ambitions in terms of love and romance and also uh, having her own life and whether or not those two uh, interests in her life can peacefully coincide or maybe there is some kind of of uh, tension between them that is irreparable and that tension I think uh, affects her immediately uh, potentially it affects her uh, quite uh, directly and quite uh, quite immediately, but also it could be said to be it, it, it's in its own way a kind of of stand-in for one of the stories that could be said to be part of the uh, makeup of uh, say the, the 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 population of Cuba, of Cuba or Havana, uh, sort of these urban uh, spots. Uh, you know the the way in which opportunities or lack thereof uh, might be indeed lacking or perhaps opportunities might arise but they do have uh, their uh, consequences attached to them which have a social financial political and indeed emotional impact uh, so that I think is is one way in which the intimate and the epic uh, the intimate and the the interpersonal and the the historical seem to collide in this very very uh, in this way that uh, in the context of a story like the first episode that is very uh, I think uh, it draws one in in an, an incredibly fast fascinating way. Um, and then we have the second story, which is the story of the farmer, uh, Pedro, right, and uh, his children who are very proudly working uh, in this rural farm setting, or working the farm. Um, and uh, we realize that uh, through a lot of hard work, a lot of labor, a lot of uh, dedication, that is years, years, and a lot of physical toil and sweat and tears, uh, he is uh, at last seemingly finding himself to be having this wonderful crop, which is expressed in many ways like the, the glorious nature of the music, the camera as it, as it almost, um, uh, through its own movement, seems to suggest the, the, the great... Uh, nascent, a uh, nascent birth of uh, these crops from the ground, uh, in this glorious way. Uh, but these hopes are um, uh, perhaps potentially about to be dashed because of uh, again external forces that seem to be underway. Um, you know, because uh, we understand almost immediately too that uh, this farmer, uh, uh, who is uh, a little bit older. Uh, who has uh, ch uh, children, uh, part of his family, who are also growing up. Uh, we understand that this farmer or the farmer family do not seem to be owners of the land, but rather they are tenants. And so we have, therefore, the aspect of the landowner, the farmer landowner coming in. And we understand, too, that through those external forces, the land is to be sold off to a corporate interest. And so what is to be had of this crop? What is to be had of the farmer's livelihood? What is to be had of the family? 
And uh, these are the types of economic, social economic forces that I was indicating earlier are show, showing themselves in terms of the external movements that seem to be beyond the control of the individual. But how the individual reacts or responds to such situations, that seems to be one of the main key points, at least as far as I gather it when I watch this film, I Am Cuba. And so we see, for instance, in the context of this farmer, uh, Pedro, how he will react and what it is he is able to do either to defend himself or defend his livelihood or try to maintain a sense of financial uh, stability or even uh, emotional dignity uh, and whether or not he will be successful in that. And so again, here we have a story of it's a different uh, maybe setting or locale than say the first story of uh, Maria and uh, Havana, etc., nightlife of Havana, but we have uh, someone in a similar situated position of maybe external forces affecting the livelihood, this time being that of the, the farmer, the tenant farmer and his family, and seeing how uh, he may or may not be able to to uh, survive and defend himself and depend, depend his position, and how therefore the external forces are having, and the social, political, external forces are having their effect on the personal and the individual, uh, and how that then becomes ultimately one of the key focal points of the film, because you know the, 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 the story could be said, and this is true for all the stories, they are always focusing on the individual. It's, it's not necessarily a story that is, in a documentary fashion, showcasing key uh, historical points leading up to 1959, but rather we get these by implication or we understand through a kind of lyrical, poetic, cinema fashion. Uh, maybe the dialogue is, uh, is, is, over, uh, is recorded over certain scenes of sort of lyrical poetry in which the landscape is shown. Uh, so we understand through this wonderful cinematic, uh, cinematic um, um, uh, shorthand, uh, uh, sort of poetic uh, grace notes uh, that uh, all is not well. And so um, the point that I want to make about that is it's therefore uh, a way that I think Kalatozov and company are showing the external forces that might be grandiose and large, but sh always showing them in a very intimate scale, intimate setting, always seeing how the individuals are affected. Uh, which I think is uh, one of the key points of, of the, the, the fascinating nature of I Am Cooper. And it's certainly the case, I would say, in how the second story is, is, uh, is showcased. Uh, but then we have uh, the third story, uh, which is uh, from another, say, a strata, a social strata or generational strata of uh, a Cuban society, that being sort of a younger generation, students, uh, and in particular the story of Enrique. Uh, and this is, uh, I understand, focusing in on a story of students at the university. I think it's in Havana. And uh, they are uh, they are pro uh, revolutionary in terms of their politics, and we see this in, in how they respond to uh, certain news early on in the segment about uh, the possibility of uh, Fidel Castro being killed, and so uh, their reaction or response to this seems to indicate their uh, political allegiances. But uh, we see uh, the uh, uprise uh, uprising uh, of uh, maybe a kind of feeling of discontent. Uh, uh, among the masses, uh, again, uh, taking root in the uh, the city setting or urban setting, uh, but this time from the viewpoint of uh, another sort of generational group, uh, and, and Enrique's story being the, the one of the focal points, because we have him and his group, uh, the student groups, uh, and how uh, certain clashes with, say, uh, military forces uh, become uh, quite escalating as the segment progresses, and so it becomes, in many ways, uh, the point of uh, of of. Well, I mean, in many ways, it could be said to be a point of of life or death stakes, do or die type of dilemmas that these people are facing, and that leads to uh, uh, uprisings, protests, uh, revolts, even, and sort of staging of uh, demonstrations uh, where we have, uh, on the one side, certain voices of the student body uh, expressed by Enrique and his, uh, his, um, uh, his friends and, and um, uh, his friends and uh, uh, associates on the one hand, and also the military forces on the other. And there are also certain dilemmas that are interwoven in this discussion. In other words, at what point is lethal force justified or not? I mean, this is a very, very, uh, very a scary question. Uh, and this is discussed, I think, with much uh, honesty uh, early on in the segment. You know, this idea of what kind of forms 
you know, the student protests in the context of NDK and company, what kind of forms would be quote unquote acceptable? Uh, and what does it mean to be acceptable in this way? I mean, what are the goals of the protests? Is the goal of the protest to be a kind of quote unquote peaceful protest that is uh, within the contours of the law? Or is the nature of the protest one that the only way that uh, some kind of social transformation can be even possible is by um, by exceeding the bounds of a kind of um, uh, 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 demonstration proportionality. And so there are some, I think, very difficult questions that are uh, raised about at what point is lethal force justified, if at all, in the context of these stories. And so uh, and that becomes, I think, a key driving force in terms of, uh, I think, a very nuanced discussion and depiction of, of uh, the demonstrations and the protests uh, that escalate and escalate and escalate. Uh, again, leading one to, again, uh, regard this from certain viewpoints, again, as another aspect, another angle of the story of Cuba leading to 1959 and seeing how um, uh, transformation does occur uh, and in what form transformation occurs. I mean, is it, um, I mean, the phrase that's used is changing the hearts and minds and whether indeed that could be enough to start or ignite a kind of revolution that may follow or that may come uh, beyond the contours of, uh, of the end credits of the film. But uh, it's a very, another very powerful story. And again, how external forces seem to be affecting uh, people on a very intimate scale. And it, perhaps it's that one of the thesis, uh, theses of the film about uh, the, the, nation, the, the notion of social transformation, the notion of uh, revolution how this could be said to be, at least in the context of these stories and these vignettes uh, in Cuba, uh, this could be said to be something of a very internal type of spark, uh, uh, egged on or, or uh, spurred on by external forces, mind you, but still uh, ultimately an internal one. So, uh, yes, and then the final story, we have the final story. Said, this is the four stories uh, with Mariano and his family. This is also a farmer uh, family, uh, maybe in slightly, maybe similar situation with the uh, the family from the earlier story, but also slightly different situation in terms of of the the age of the family, slightly different generational uh, considerations as well. But we see uh, how someone who uh, might want to be completely uh, completely out of politics, maybe not wanting to be part of the revolution, uh, but just wanting to essentially mind his own business and, and uh, fend for himself and, and, and uh, live his livelihood and take care of his family in a way that is, at least from his immediate vicinity, one that is peaceful and without any type of chaos. But when the, when the military forces or external forces intrude upon his space in a way that is very violent and quite shocking, what is he to do? And what is he to do in order to protect himself and his family? But what is he to do in terms of how he becomes transformed? So it could be said to be, uh, could be a, a veiled or cloaked discussion of pacifism, or it could be a veiled or cloaked discussion of the way in which uh, revolutionary forces seem to be uh, making their ways into the hearts and minds of people who who themselves are not political people, who themselves are not are not um, you know they're not protesters or they're not uh, uh, people who have certain positions of social economic power, but um, really uh, families, uh, people who are taking care of their children or uh, people who are just trying to make their livelihoods in this uh, in from their way, their very family or private or humble ways. And how these people themselves are also being affected by uh, the, the social currents of change. So uh, whether it's uh, through their choice or otherwise. And so uh, this is the, the story here. Um, uh, and um, uh, it becomes also, uh, I think, another very harrowing tale, a tale of transformation, a tale of how external forces can transform the inside in a way that may be uh, perhaps uh, inevitable. And again, it's kind of parallel of, of the personal and the historical uh, that's at play in a, in a work like this. And I should say too that all across these four tales as a type of leitmotif, uh, we have uh, a voice, a narrator, who is uh, the female narrator, the voice, uh, who is described uh, as being the voice of, of uh, Cuba. Uh, I am Cuba. And I'm Cuba. And so therefore, this is the leitmotif voice that seems to be suggesting that these are various facets, these vignettes or the groups of people that we meet along the way of these four short stories. These are various facets or angles 
of uh, of the whole that is Cuba. The the, the main character in a manner of speaking could be that of Cuba itself, and so in that way we see uh, how again the external uh, affects the internal, and how that external affecting affecting the internal perhaps could be the catalyst or the spark of some kind of of uh, of uh, a revolution. Uh, and so if we understand, again, the trajectory of this uh, the story up to 1959, as well as when the film is being made and released, 1964, which itself is a very critical period of, uh, of uh, national history, and we understand that this voice of Cuba is really uh, through uh, the voice itself and also through the expression of these stories is a kind of story of the nation itself and the people itself. So... Um, it's a, a very powerful work. Um, there's a lot here, it's, uh, but I, I want to say that it, it goes by, I think, very quickly uh, because the stories themselves are, are very captivating in their own way, and they sweep you up, um, and I think they're very easily accessible, and they're quite understandable. I mean, um, you know, I understand uh, based on, um, uh, say, some of the supplements, you know, uh, when this film was released, one of the, it, it was uh, maybe criticized by some circles, perhaps as being overly simplistic in some ways, but um, I don't necessarily view the film or the stories in that way because there's a lot of detail uh, in terms of the kind of the social currency of the time that seems to be implied in a lot of the setting and, and decor that is part of their uh, stories. That's one thing. And also there's a lot that is uh, expressed but also not expressed as well, which is another thing too. And also the, st the stories never shy away from, I think, really difficult questions and perhaps making us as viewers question whether or not the characters as we see them react and respond, whether or not we can say that they are making the quote-unquote right decisions or not. I mean, we see characters that we come to care about in this film throughout these stories do things that perhaps might be quite questionable or maybe even wrong or maybe even uh, morally... Um, morally uh, uh, um, repulsive even, uh, or at the very least ambiguous. And so um, that, I think, alone makes for these stories to be themselves quite complex, at least potentially anyway. So uh, I think the, 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 the questions I don't think are, are ever, um, uh, maybe there, there's no flinching, uh, which I really I think is one of the strengths of this film. Uh, and then also to the, the and also the structure, I think, makes for very uh, engaging viewing because it's it's very easy to follow. I think the stories are well told and the structures, I think, it has a type of progression, perhaps. Different uh, walks of life, different people uh, that have a connection of Cuba, that have a connection of certain the external forces affecting the internal uh, and their livelihoods and sort of social, political, economic currents. Uh, each in their own ways, though, individually are affected uh, and their own choices themselves are their own. But... Uh, there's also this uh, this way in which I think um, the structure is really nice as well because uh, we have the the I think the nice almost digestible aspect of the storytelling you know the short story aspect you know we get into each story uh, in its own on its own merits uh, in a very easy to access sort of way and then also uh, we understand that one could say there's a progression too of certain movements or flows or ideas maybe the first two stories could be said to be the recognition of the problem but not knowing the solutions to the problem but then we get to the third stories or the fourth stories maybe we are seeing how certain characters might be trying to find solutions to the problems that are being raised starting from the first uh, vignette. So there's a kind of progress that could be said to be itself its own nuanced way of maybe a kind of transformative, uh, a cinematic uh, way of showing the transformative leading up to 1959 and beyond. So uh, the structure therefore becomes really key. Uh, and then we have the wonderful, uh, sometimes uh, maybe elliptical, sometimes ephemeral, sometimes uh, quite uh, lyrical and poetic ways that the, the film and the camera just it weaves in and out of the black and white cinematography, which is beautiful. I mean, the way that the the uh, the, 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 the the scene brightens up um, when you have the sunshine on the uh, on the farmland, for instance, with the, the the brilliance of the crop. You have the wonderful black and white photography just uh, making it shine and in a sort of glorious way, but then when there are certain aspects of, of gloom 
and portent, the, 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 the black and white photography turns into this really dark, ominous, shadowed way, which I think is this, the, the great beauty of the cinematography and the, uh, the ways in which that the film is used, you know, infrared, uh, etc. is used. And we'll get into some of those details when we talk about the uh, Urzevsky's uh, work as cinematographer, when we talk about the supplements. But uh, the, the artistry of the cinematography uh, cannot be emphasized enough, you know, and also the movement of the camera. Uh, there's, there are ways in which we have a camera uh, weaving, bobbing in and out of space, uh, seemingly just jumping through space that is almost like impossible, uh, the way that it just tilts and, and uh, captures angles and goes from air to water or, or um, has these uh, really uh, sharp angles, uh, angular, that uh, really defies the sense of this film as a kind of uh, of uh, cinema verite. I mean, far from it. It is really he applying a kind of style, uh, really uh, uh, heavily uh, applied lyrical style, uh, and the way that uh, certain shots of people on the street are framed, or the way that leaflets are flying through the air in a very, uh, maybe from a one viewpoint, chaotic manner, but from another viewpoint, a very graceful manner. I mean, these are very highly structured shots uh, that uh, themselves, therefore, suggest a type of, of construction uh, uh, that is part of this film. So I like that kind of uh, very interesting, uh, almost... Um, a challenging dynamic between uh, stories which we as viewers could understand to be taking its uh, inspirations from sort of uh, uh, real life movements or instances on the one hand, uh, with the uh, with the added benefit, of course, of setting itself against the backdrop of history, which is immediate, uh, immediately understandable, especially to contemporary audiences of the time, but then also realizing that this film is highly constructed. And uh, even in that high construction, I mean, there there is a way in which sort of beauty showcases through, which then could it could lead back to the initial point of, of is this kind of challenging combination of say uh, social realism on the one hand and uh, high construction of uh, sort of cinematic lyrical quality is this there for a combination that turns us into uh, a product of propaganda? I mean, it's a very legitimate and valid question to have you know, sort of adding a certain sense of allure and polish to uh, certain film stories that have at its very root a kind of of uh, maybe promotion of a certain set of ideal ideologies, political ideologies. I mean, that's a very, uh, that is part of the conversation as well. Uh, and it's uh, very good to have. But again, as I was trying to mention earlier, I think that's very key in terms of an engagement of film like this film, I Am Cuban. And that doesn't take away, I think, from uh, the power of that engagement. And in fact, I think, uh, at least from my perspective, it really enhances it and it really... Uh, calls into question these types of images and how they how they affect me uh, from my vantage point watching this film again in 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 2024 uh, but then seeing uh, what it what it is I'm seeing and how life and death is depicted I mean there are moments where you can say that life and death are depicted in a way that are very much I think very uh, powerfully uh, staged and powerfully set but still in a very poetic and lyrical way um, that might be very much not quote unquote real uh, end quote, uh, but there are also moments that also depict life and death uh, stakes in a way that also have that light uh, that real quality to it. And I'm going to use quotes here uh, to acknowledge the sort of the cinematic craft of this film. But the point that I want to make is that this film I think has uh, many different. Um, modes of style that are blended together, sometimes in a very compatible way, sometimes in a very challenging way, but always in a way that provokes and always in a way that, that makes one consider and think uh, our engagement with the work, uh, as well as what it is that the film is uh, capturing within the very folds of the, the frames. And uh, for my money, I find that type of engagement to be uh, very, very stimulating and uh, quite provocative. And again, uh, from my admittedly very intellectually shallow positioning, uh, I still look at this film uh, with, a, uh, with an attempt to look at it from varying perspectives. And all the while, all the time, I am very captivated by it and I am very taken with it. And I, I will uh, be taken with the stories and then seeing how I'm able to process it and how I'm able to try to make sense of what it is I'm seeing, that becomes yet a further journey that I have with myself in terms of my own subjective reaction to the film. Uh, but that is, I think, one of the great 
aspects, the great grace notes, the great type of, um, of uh, uh, engagement that this film welcomes and invites. Uh, it, it certainly does, I think, in a very commanding and very powerful way. Uh, this is the work uh, which is I Am Cuba. The Criterion Collection has released this film, I Am Cuba, Soy Cuba, uh, courtesy of this 4K UHD and Blu-ray release, so it's two discs. Again, it's spy number 1214, and uh, that's what I have here. I have the 4K disc in the machine right now behind me. Uh, please note that the, uh, the menu, the 4K, the disc menu is one of these wonderful a montage of moving images from the film, uh, but again, for purposes of this YouTube video discussion, I've just blocked it out uh, uh, lest I offend the YouTube's copyright gods. So uh, I hope you can understand. I apologize for my very, very amateurish way of uh, handling that particular point, but I hope you can understand. Uh, but it is a really great uh, uh, 4K or disc uh, menu when you put the disc into the player. Uh, but the reason why I've put this in is just, among other things, to try to showcase or just introduce comments about the master. Uh, I've also removed, uh, for purposes of this video discussion, uh, the leaflet here, uh, which is a fold-out leaflet. And uh, one of the things that is mentioned in the fold-out leaflet is notes about the master, and I quote, This 4K restoration was created from a 35mm fine grain positive. The original Monaro soundtrack was remastered from the 35mm original magnetic tracks. Upon its ill-fated 1964 release, I Am Cuba screened only in the Soviet Union and Cuba, and it wasn't until 1992 that the film, by then long out of circulation, had its very first U.S. screening at the Telluride Film Festival, recalling how scholar Stephen P. Hill, in a 1967 issue of Film Quarterly, had deemed I Am Cuba, quote, the most brilliant Soviet film since the 1920s, end quote. Telluride programmers Tom Luddy and Bill Pence, with the help of the Pacific Film Archive's Edith Kramer, obtained a print of the film, which they showed as part of a retrospective of director Mikhail Kalatozov's work. Following another rapturously received screening at the 1993 San Francisco International Film Festival, Milestone Films began the process of acquiring the rights to the film. The company's theatrical distribution of I Am Cuba two years later, in a release kicking off at New York City's Film Forum, and co-presented by two of the film's most prominent admirers, Francis Ford Coppola and Martin Scorsese, clinch the film's stateside rediscovery, end quote. So this is, again, I read from the notes about the master. Uh, very interesting. Again, the, the release history of this film is one of the fascinating aspects of this. But um, uh, the presentation, yes. So as I mentioned, you know, um, uh, there were uh, releases of this film, uh, say on Laserdisc and also uh, VHS, uh, you know, I remember from uh, around circa the 90s. Uh, so, uh, but, uh, so I know the film from those early, early, early releases uh, that were made available, uh, including the Laserdisc. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was uh, uh, at the time the only way uh, again, to, for uh, people uh, uh, like me where I was to be able to watch the film in that way. And so I knew the film through uh, my experiences with, say, uh, those early home media examples, which were really great at the time, really great. And even now, looking back, really, really great. Um, but I must say that uh, looking at the film now through this presentation, uh, it's stunning, absolutely stunning. Uh, again, the richness of the black and white photography, I mean, it was always there, but there's just something about how it pops out now. It, it's, uh, it's, it's just uh, vivid and striking. And uh, I, I like the, the note, too, that there's the, I should uh, note that the, um, the soundtrack, uh, to it, it has the Spanish language soundtrack available, uh, but then there's also the option of uh, sort of the Russian it's called the Russian dubbed language, which is really the Spanish soundtrack, but you have immediately over that uh, the voice of a sort of a Russian interpreter, uh, uh, so speaking. So um, it's interesting. I, I I'm uh, uh, I watched the film uh, twice when I got the Criterion was one with the Spanish uh, language track and one with that added uh, Russian uh, explanatory track as well. So it was an interesting exercise, but I must admit it was, I, I find maybe for me personally, uh, the the uh, the original or the 
and this, the, the, uh, the, the, the track without that explanatory uh, note, I find that track to be, the, for me personally, the more preferable. But it's good to have the option of listening to both. But, uh, but going back again to the presentation, this looks amazing. This looks absolutely amazing. Um, and it's just, uh, I hope maybe this is the opportunity for the film to be even more part of the conversation. More people, I hope, will be able to watch this film. And if you are watching this film for the first time, I think uh, there, uh, it's, uh, you're, this is uh, look, the best way to look at it in terms of home media releases. It really is uh, the best way. So uh, it, uh, great, absolutely great. And, you know, I saw it on the 4K disc, which is what I have in the player. It looks great. And I saw it again on the Blu-ray as well. It looks really great in both formats that are available here. So uh, all in all, uh, hats off uh, to uh, the and the people who uh, devoted so much to, uh, you know, the uh, uh, the re-release or the the re uh, the reevaluation of this film, beginning in the uh, the early to mid 1990s, and then of course this being yet another chapter of that great sort of re rediscovery of this film. I am Cuba, courtesy of this most recent release uh, in this year, 2024. Bravo. Okay, so now I have the. Blu-ray in the player uh, right now, so this will give me the opportunity to talk with you, my dear friends, a little bit about the supplements that can be found with this Criterion release of this film, uh, the Kalapozov work, I Am Cuba. Uh, once again, this is what I have here is the 4K UHD and Blu-ray, so two discs, the 4K disc or UHD disc and then the Blu-ray disc. The 4K UHD disc, which is what I had in the player before, had the film uh, with uh, the the setup in terms of the, the possible setup options for audio. Uh, but it didn't have the supplements. If you want to go to the supplements, you have to go to the Blu-ray. The Blu-ray, which is now what I have in the player, has the film and uh, also the all the, uh, the setup options related to your watching of the film on the Blu-ray. Plus, it has the added uh, section of supplements on the Blu-ray. So, uh, much like all the other Criterion 4K plus Blu-ray releases, if you want to go to the supplements, uh, we're going to go to the Blu-ray disc, which is what I have here. And again, just for note, uh, the Blu-ray disc menu is, again, the moving image montage of shots. So I'm just going to block it out uh, here for purposes of not offending YouTube copyright gods. So I hope you can understand uh, and forgive me for that. But uh, it is a really good uh, assembly of uh, shots from the film. Uh, but I go to the supplements menu, and I see four supplements that come up. First is I Am Cuba, uh, the Siberian Mammoth. Okay, so this is really great. This is um, the making of I Am Cuba was as epic in scope as the film itself. This 2004 documentary directed by Vicente Ferraz is a thorough exploration that, uh, of that process from the arrival of Soviet filmmakers Mikhail Kalatozov and Sergei Uruzevsky in Havana to the movie's years-long production and tepid reception and its international rediscovery in the 1990s. It features interviews with key participants and rare behind-the-scenes footage. This is, uh, I think, for me and my own journey with the film I Am Cuba, this is a critical, this is such a critical and crucial documentary. Uh, fairly recent, right? So from 2004. So it's great to have this. And again, the perspective looking back on this film with some hindsight uh, and also uh, being able to catch up with some of the key uh, figures of the production of this film. Uh, so, for instance, some people who are interviewed uh, quite directly here, uh, people like um, uh, Raul Rodriguez uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, the camera work and uh, his work there and talking about certain locations of the factories and the uh, you know, cigars, and uh, one of the actors, Sergio Corrieri, uh, and also um, Luz Maria Colazzo is also interviewed a little bit later, and, and we see her actually watching one of the scenes that she's in, you know, uh, uh, portraying uh, Maria Betty, and it's a really emotional moment. Um, uh, and then also uh, speaking with uh, Enrique Pina Barnett, uh, talking about uh, his uh, contribution in terms of the writing, because uh, he's credited and uh, co-credited in terms of the screenplay, and talking about the film uh, in how their of their impressions of it as a type of giant epic poem, uh, in a lot of reception, in a lot of ways. 
and also the uh, the way in which the film, uh, in many ways, was a was you know in terms of the co collaboration between different film industries. Uh, and so there's a little bit of discussion about uh, the Cuban um, uh, uh, film scene and the art scene. Uh, the I C A I C is mentioned earlier, the, uh, which is in, uh, known in English or translated into English as the Cuban Institute of C uh, Cinematographic Art and Industry. Uh, and the figure of Alfredo uh, Guevara is, is mentioned here, and he speaks a little bit here. Um, but also there is the, the intersection with um, uh, uh, the Russian or Soviet film industry, uh, and that leads to the collaboration uh, with... Um, uh, with uh, um, Mikhail Kalatozov and Sergei Ruzevsky and uh, Bella Friedman and others uh, who uh, come to Cuba. And uh, it's described as, uh, you know, in terms of the development of the stories or the stories, uh, it seems like they were given, relatively speaking, uh, kind of fairly uh, a wide uh, room for sort of uh, creativity. So it's fairly independent uh, in that respect, which is uh, interesting too. And also there's an opportunity to speak about the filmmaking or the process of uh, Rusevsky, the cinematographer, and also Kalatozov, the director. Uh, and there's some interesting in anecdotes that come into play. Uh, there's one anecdote in particular which I really enjoyed about about, for instance, about Kalatozov, about how he had this kind of calm demeanor. Uh, he wouldn't necessarily uh, stand up too much. When they were scouting locations, he would stay in his car for most of the time, or when he was on location shooting, he would sort of command the, the scene, but from a distance in a, in a very calm but uh, very commanding way. Uh, uh, so that's for Kalatozov. And then for Urbisevsky, there's a great uh, anecdote about how... Um, you know, he would right, to try to look through the, the camera uh, viewfinder. And uh, and also, he there would be moments where he would close his eyes and shut his eyes for a long period of time before he'd open them and go to the camera. And the reason that is uh, cited for him doing this is to, to because when he closed his eyes for a, a long period of time, that meant that when he opened them, the light would become, he would become all the more sensitive to the light, which meant that he was able to pick up uh, the sensitivity of light in a certain scene of maybe of the outdoors, etc., which I think is, a, I mean, I'm not an artist, I'm not a cinematographer or photographer, so uh, these things become even more of a learning experience when I learn about them. And also a reminder, too, of things like um, Ursescu really liked clouds in the sky, uh, which you can see very evidently in a lot of the outdoor scenes. I mean, it's an epic way in which the film is being shot. So, um, And then we have... Um, um, the way in which this film, too, as it was being made, I mean, there's uh, there's a, a kind of a feeling in the air uh, in terms of this uh, uh, international cooperation uh, in terms of the making of this film uh, and how there's a kind of feeling of aspiration and hope uh, in terms of, of uh, a Cuban filmmaking. Uh, and the like, and so uh, and there's also a lot of attention from uh, many people from uh, other parts of uh, the cinema community, uh, figures of say the French New Wave, etc., really uh, coming and paying attention to how this film was being made as perhaps a, a potential model of uh, of a certain filmmaking uh, industry uh, to follow, perhaps, or at least that was the idea. Um, and then we have, of course, uh, I may mention Kalatozov and, and the importance of Kalatozov's voice, uh, the prominence that he had uh, from earlier works, like uh, works that are known in English as uh, Cranes Are Flying, etc. And, and as some of you know Kalatozov's works, uh, you can find a number of them already in other great examples of Criterion Collection physical media releases. So, uh, And then uh, the importance of the collaboration uh, between and among uh, Kalatozov and Bella Friedman and uh, Rusevsky. Uh, uh, so it's interesting, too, again, about the story development. There didn't seem to be a kind of fixed idea when they arrived. Um, nothing was already predestined, set in stone in a matter of saying that's my understanding, but it kind of developed organically in that way. But it's interesting, too, because I think there are some comments later on uh, that some people, uh, you know, part of the crew on Cuba, uh, when they saw the film later, maybe they had certain reservations about whether it really could be said to be a film that was quote-unquote authentically portraying aspects of Cuban culture at the time. I mean, there are obviously very uh, points of sort of culture that are depicted, for instance, in some of the ways in which, uh, which um, music and uh, uh, other aspects of the decor and and uh, and, and setting and ambiance are depicted. I mean, it, and the setting, of course, the environment uh, where it's set in the title as well as the the construct of the stories. But 
there are ways in which I think certain people might have reserva- as they express it in their interviews here, might have reservations in calling this film or regarding this film as a film that is portraying certain sensibilities of uh, of the people of Cuba. Uh, because there are certain rhythms of the film that could be said, and it's going back to this idea of how highly constructed and maybe even lyrical a lot of the shots are. Are these really quote unquote shots that are 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 from the quote unquote authentic voice of sort of a way that um, these feelings would be represented? Uh, from the, a Cuban cinema perspective, or are these from the Soviet or Russian perspective of how they they are regarding aspects of Cuban culture and society? So I think that's a very interesting uh, question in and of itself. You know, how does this film fit into the context of you know the expression of the society and culture and people, and and wh- where the film figures in in terms of its place in say Soviet film history or Russian film history, and or in Cuban film history, etc. And uh, there's an interesting uh, way in which that film, uh, the, the, that uh, that uh, uh, it also lends itself to maybe, is is the making of the film, uh, was it a kind of, of joint collaboration or are there ways in which, uh, the ways in which um, images and ideas and aspects of culture of Cuba are being adopted in the form of the film that could be said to be itself, maybe even from a cynical point of view, uh, condescending, uh, maybe uh, a positioning of sort of uh, cultural superiority that itself uh, is not uh, authentic. And I think those questions uh, are quite quite bold and, and very important to have. Uh, but there are also ways in which the film can uh, be said to be very much itself, maybe directly or indirectly influencing other films uh, within the region, uh, within, within Cuba's uh, film industry and maybe in the neighboring countries' uh, 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 respective uh, cinema cultures and industries. I mean, uh, and how uh, the camera work of, say, Urzevsky, uh really uh, showcased the way in which there's a, a kind of handheld uh, uh, electricity that uh, is, you know, I think, one of the film's hypotheses or uh, is positing that maybe this is a kind of direct or indirect refer- uh, influence to a lot of the other examples of, of um, cinema of Cuba or cinema of other neighboring nations uh, that had this kind of uh, same uh, very charged style to the cinematography. So uh, it, it may or may not, but it certainly is an interesting question to have or discussion to have in terms of the, the reach of the influence of uh, Kalatozov and uh, Urzevsky in the context of of uh, the Cuban film scene and beyond. So uh, that, and that those questions and others, I think, are directed, uh, were addressed here in this great documentary, um, and as well as uh, you know, going back to things like finding the actors, the the, the casting decisions, um, uh, the reception to the film immediately. I mean, it was described in a lot of places as being tepid, lukewarm, mixed. Um, there's a lot too of of the um, uh, of the um, um, of the sort of the, the social political dynamics of the time in the early to mid 1960s, and so it made uh, perhaps uh, it impossible to have this film get a global international release, let alone right a, a release in say uh, the United States film market. So uh, then it led to uh, a kind of renaissance of this film in the 1990s, as uh, described here and and elsewhere about uh, the dis- the rediscovery of this film and uh, Martin Scorsese in particular. Um, there's also Francis Ford Coppola, Martin Scorsese, and others, um, but uh, uh, very prominent voices uh, who then uh, were discovering this film and championing this film uh, uh, quite uh, quite passionately, which then led to uh, the uh, uh, distribution of this film on an international market starting in the 1990s and then leading to its final, or not final, to its most latest chapter of that, this uh, Criterion release. So, um, uh, so yes, so, uh, and then the work of, um, of, as it was mentioned before, uh, Milestone Films. So, Yes. So, and it's an interesting thing too about, you know, what, and what is, is, do we look at that in a positive way too, or is that too a kind of cynical, cynical type of approach to how films get known? You know, um, uh, what is it about these, the, these voices that got the film its, uh, its attention to begin with? I mean, I mean, and so what I, I bring that up is because the documentary itself, I think is very, 
it, it, it has certain levels of nuance, which I really appreciate. I really, really appreciate. So as well as giving us a tour into essentially the making of this film and all the, the contours and details and, and uh, risks and, and potential pitfalls and ultimate success, even years, years, years later of this film. So uh, this is really great. Uh, I should have mentioned too uh, that the documentary itself is approximately one hour and 31 minutes. So it's like its own film. Uh, and you get so much information packed in it. Uh, it's it's really wonderful. So uh, please watch this if you can. I, it's, I think, essential viewing. Uh, it's really great uh, to uh, uh, combine with your watch of I Am Cuba. So it's uh, the Sib uh, Siberian Mammoth. And it's interesting to, when you watch the film, uh, see how the title Siberian Mammoth is, uh, 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 what its relevance is. So, uh, so please check out this uh, documentary from the early 2000s. Then, uh, from the supplements, we have Bradford Young, and this is cinematographer Bradford Young pays homage to the innovative aesthetics of I Am Cuba and the lessons to be learned from its depiction of the revolutionary spirit in this interview recorded for the Criterion Collection in 2023. This is really great um, because uh, this is uh, Bradford Young and in this discussion, one-on-one -on -one discussion with him, it's approximately 22 minutes, speaking about I Am Cuba, speaking about aspects of Kalatazov's uh, directed film and also focusing in uh, a lot on the cinematography aspect uh, Urzevsky's work with I Am Cuba, talking about this film in terms of active participation, talking about this film in terms of uh, the epic poem nature of the of the work, the rhythms, and how those cinema, or cinema uh, photographic rhythms are uh, directly intertwined with a kind of revolutionary spirit. So it's this idea, which I think is very much akin to, you know, the arts in general, but I think cinema for me as a really wonderful vivid example is sort of make, make, making manifest the, uh, the sort of the amorphous ideals you know, revolutionary spirit that, that has a, in, in certain ways, it's a kind of, uh, um, uh, it's a concept, right? But it's a concept that ma it makes itself manifest through all different forms of uh, physical action uh, and, and expression. And I think one of the, con the conceits or one of the thesis points of uh, Bradford Young here is that that revolutionary spirit is made manifest in a certain way uh, with the cinema, uh, cinema uh, photographic choices uh, that were made here. Uh, so he mentions, for instance, intense angles, so sweeping camera movements, a kind of use of camera to show growth of plants or, or maybe to diminish people or to showcase the, the, uh, the widespread, uh, uh, maybe corrupting influence of authoritarian regimes, etc. So uh, that type of manifestation of the, uh, the influx, if you will, of, of uh, the revolutionary spirit or the transformative process of people uh, and uh, which is incredibly important also he speaks too about um, uh, the, he loves the mix of the documentary style on the one hand and how he how he describes it as the beautiful self-aware narrative filmmaking aspects on the other and this is what I was trying to allude to earlier in my discussion about the challenging mix between social realism on the one hand and uh, 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 artistic constructed shots on the other but I think Bradford Young describes it in a much better way than I ever could a documentary style on the one and beautiful self-aware narrative filmmaking techniques on the other and that is I think the one of the best ways to regard this it is a really interesting mix of this uh, and we also see this too in the way that the, the camera work uh, shows itself. There are some moments where the camera allows for the scene to uh, l let us absorb the scene from the social realism perspective, but then there are other moments that are very much, and I think quite on purpose, calling attention to themselves in this wonderful, highly stylized way. So, uh, brilliant comment. So astute, so genius from uh, Bradford Young. Uh, uh, I applaud that immensely. Among uh, all of his other comments here, and as a discussion too about the significance of the use of the infrared uh, and the filmmaking technique and sort of uh, the way in which it showcases and highlights grays and blacks and whites in the in the 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 the, uh, the, photo, the photographic uh, composition and how it really picks up those uh, those uh, the bright whites of the of the photographic image of the black and white photo, or the, the really uh, really intensifies the dark uh, blacks and the grays in between. So it's a really great lesson, uh, especially again for someone like myself. I'm not a photographer, so uh, these points are very very uh, insightful and uh, they teach a lot. So this is really great. The Bradford Young discussion. It's approximately 22 minutes. 
it is outstanding. So please check that out if you can. Then there is Martin Scorsese, and this is filmmaker Martin Scorsese discusses I Am Cuba, as well as his role in redistributing the movie in the United States decades after its original release in this 2003 interview. So this is a Martin Scorsese uh, 2003 interview. He's sitting, uh, it's, it's, uh, he's sitting there. It's Martin Scorsese. Um, uh, I mean, it, it, it's, it's wonderful to hear Martin Scorsese talk and to hear him laugh and to hear him so passionate. It's almost his own commentary. And it's not, it's not a, uh, it's not a brief discussion too either. It's about 28 minutes. So it's, it's, it's an involved discussion where he goes into a lot of specifics. It's almost like its own select scene commentary from Scorsese in a way, which is really awesome. A really, really awesome thing. Um, and also he dis discusses it also from his own personal perspective about watching the film for the first time, right, in the 90s and his kind of self-discovery. And and he, he describes it in a really fascinating way. It's like, had filmmakers known and watched this film when he was, uh, you know, early on in his life, in his career, you know, in the 60s, 70s, had people like him and others uh, were able to watch the film, the filmmaking would be in a totally different place, or he would be a completely diff different filmmaker than who he was, which is one of the greatest compliments. Uh, it's really quite wonderful. Uh, so, and he talks too about the importance of the long takes, uh, the importance of the details that are captured in the long takes, and talking too about um, the again epic poem is mentioned here by Scorsese and others. I think that's so apropos. Uh, and then talking too about the the troubled distribution history of this film, how it was sh essentially shelved and not shown for years and years and years. Uh, until the opportunity arose uh, with the you know the prominence of uh, people in the film community like Francis Ford Coppola, like Martin Scorsese and others, um, to be able to bring this to new audiences. Um, great, this is great. So a discussion with Martin Scorsese again. He knows this film intimately, and he knows the background as to how this film got quote unquote you know um, it, it, how it found uh, more audiences uh, in the 1990s and beyond. So. This is really great to have. So this is approximately 20, 28 minutes, so please check it out if you can. And then the trailer. Uh, this is the trailer which appears to be, right, the trailer that was used uh, circa 1995, so mid-90s uh, in that area. So uh, again, uh, Francis Ford Coppola's name, uh, Martin Scorsese's name is mentioned uh, uh, rather prominently in that. So uh, very interesting. So please check it out if you can. All right, so these are the, the supplements, I think, well-rounded. Um, of course, the more the merrier, I say. So it would have been great to have had more supplements. We could have had um, other discussion points about I Am Cuba, maybe some other discussion points about about um, uh, maybe um, uh, commentary tracks are always welcome. We don't get that, of course. But uh, I, again, I don't want to take away from anything from the high quality points that we of uh, the supplements that we do get here, they are long. They are robust. I mean, we get one that's its own feature length documentary making of of the film, which is really great. And there's so much information. There's so much information packed in here, as well as a uh, words of uh, really detailed and passionate in, uh, uh, comments and discussion points of admiration for the film from Bradford Young and from Martin Scorsese and others. So. Um, uh, I am very happy. I'm very impressed uh, with the supplements. India. I learned so much uh, from this. So uh, it is uh, highly, highly recommended. And so now let me speak a bit about other aspects of this uh, physical media release. Uh, the packaging, you know, the art design, uh, the cover art design, which is also taken into the leaflet or insert. Uh, I like this type of uh, montage effect of different colors and uh, uh, different uh, uh, tones here, which is, I think, reminiscent or a reminder of the the uh, the wonderful vignette uh, uh, short story uh, omnibus quality of the film. Uh, there's also a type of you know paper and and ripping of paper. This is also you know kind of the the page torn. A motif too. This is also very important, especially considering you know paper and and uh, uh, newsletters. It's a, this is a, a little bit of a, uh, a plot device, in uh, at least one of the, the the short stories of the film. 
I like this use of this font and the, the, the handwritten type of script here. Um, uh, and it says, you know, I am uh, Cuba, filmed by Mikhail Kalatozov, and you have in the back here, I like how it says I am Cuba, but then also in sort of uh, white colored uh, or handwritten type of uh, font, it says Soy Cuba. So I really enjoy that very, that little detail very much. So uh, well done uh, with this. Uh, and that motif is carried through in the uh, insert or fold out leaflet here. Uh, let me point out to, while I have the leaflet open, uh, about the art. Art director Sarah Habibi, Eric Skillman, designer Century, art production coordinator William Breeze, uh, print production artist Craig Phillips, and art assistant Julie Sussman. So uh, I'm very, very happy with this. I should also point out just a little detail which I like. Um, this is the inside, and I have this is the, uh, the plastic case with the stacked. Uh, 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 the stacked uh, nature of the uh, the casing, so the discs don't touch each other. I have on the the I have here the 4K UHD disc on the top, and actually you can see Criterion, the Criterion collection in a kind of red color. But then when I remove that disc to see the the Blu-ray underneath, it's kind of hard to make out. I apologize, but the Criterion collection is in a light blue color, uh, and, and also you can see there's a slight difference in the uh, in the intensity of the uh, of the tan brown color of I am Cuba from the Blu-ray to the uh, to the uh, um, uh, 4K as well as the image that's used on the C. And there's a slight sepia toned quality to the 4K disc, which I like those little differences. So uh, very nice indeed. Oh, I should point out too that uh, the leaflet I've I've already removed it, but it's a fold out leaflet. I'm not a fan of the fold out leaflet. I wish they did the uh, the booklet, because the booklet has more pages possibilities. It's more of a robust reading experience. But uh, the essay that's included with this uh, release is called, it's by uh, Juan Antonio Garcia uh, Borero and translated from the Spanish by Will Noah. And it's called, uh, or it's given the title here uh, in English of The Filmmakers Who Came In From the Cold. <laughs> uh, it is a, uh, it's a really great, great essay. Um, I think it touches upon all, uh, all the points that I think make great essays really great which is it, it I, I have a uh, it allows me to to learn a little bit or understand the context the historical context which is really key and the historical context not just of, of world politics but also of the filmmaking and the production uh, context and also that allows for uh, certain uh, 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 points of discussion of the film itself and Kalatozov and um, uh, Rzevsky and others and ICAIC, you know, the, the, the filmmaking um, aspect of, uh, of Cuba. Uh, it was, um, as I mentioned, this is a Cuban Institute of Cinemat uh, Cinematographic Art and Industry uh, and others. So um, this is really great. So uh, the filmmakers who came in from the cold, that's a great essay. I strongly recommend, as I do with the other essays, is to watch the film first and then you can read uh, the great essay here, uh, which I strongly suggest you do because uh, it's another wonderful learning point uh, in this overall experience of this film, courtesy of the Criterion Collection release of this film. Again, it's by number 1214. It is I Am Cuba. Um, it's, a, it's a phenomenal work. It's rich and it's very, very dense very complex it's incredibly complex uh and you know i don't claim to uh, get all of the 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 strokes of nuance of it not not slight you know i'm i'm far from it you know i'm 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 as much uh, uh, continuing to be engaged and fascinated and and uh challenged by this film uh and uh, but uh, i must say that that engagement for me so far so far has really opened my eyes to a number of its questions uh, both you know in front of the camera and beyond and so uh, it, it's and it's helped me so much in uh, what I hope to be a continuing uh, engagement with this film for many years to come uh, what a great release this is from Criterion and it is of the film which is I am Cuba all right my dear friends so that's it for now and so until we meet again Please be happy and healthy and well, and please keep on watching a lot of great, great, great movies, including I Am Cuba, including other works by uh, Kalapozov, including other films in the Criterion Collection, and beyond. So until the next video, my dear, dear friends, stay strong, stay safe, and cheers.